Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. And our guest today is Peter Van Dorn. Peter's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and editor of Regulation Magazine. Welcome back to Free Thoughts. Thanks for having me. It's my home away from home. Today we're talking about antitrust. And I guess if we're opposed to something, it might make sense to figure out what that thing is. So what is a trust? I actually didn't know myself until I started digging into this. Um, and and uh, it's, it's fascinating, which is the facts are the following. In, in 1882, the chief lawyer for Standard Oil invented this legal, uh, legal, cre- legal thing called a trust. And what the trust did is then own the stocks of other companies. And so the Standard Oil Trust or the American Sugar Trust or these things were ways to combine companies at the time without actually officially merging. And uh, the at its peak, the Standard Oil Trust owned the stock of 40 other oil companies. And the uh, literally through like what we call today for estates and things, a trust. And in 1889 and 1890, uh, the New York State courts ruled that the American Sugar Trust was illegal. So in 1892, Standard Oil actually terminated its trust arrangement and became what we now think of as just a large single corporation. But the term trust and the, and therefore antitrust has stuck, even though the trusts actually don't exist and haven't existed uh, for, you know, since 1892 in some sense, or the Standard Oil Trust at least. And, but antitrust is now the name of a policy and the name about concerns about large firms that don't seem to fit with the American Jeffersonian notions of yeoman farmer capitalism in which you can sort of touch and see and feel everything that's going on and it's not too big to imagine. Now, it seems like if you think about these eras, you have this maybe about 1890, 1880s, these big businesses, Teddy Roosevelt, trust busting, that era of uh, antitrust. But what was there before that era? Was there, there were concerns about monopolies too. I mean, I know some cases even going back to the 17th century, but a lot of those monopolies are state granted. So was it really just when the emergence of large corporations post-war that this became a concern? Pretty much, but there were concerns about markets and how they worked in English law and English statutory law. Um, And we can give people the reference to the paper that talks about them. A lot of the concerns back then, though, weren't bigness because we didn't have, you know, the Industrial Revolution had not occurred and railroads didn't exist. And so the the concerns were actually about what we now call futures markets back then, which is people with commodities could sell that couldn't sell them in large bundles to somebody who then would distribute them and things like that. So English statutory law had. Uh, it, it prohibited things called forestalling, engrossing, and regrading. And uh, forestalling is buying goods from the farmer for resale before the goods came to market. I think we would now call that a futures market. Engrossing is buying goods from farmers for resale. We would call that middlemen. And a, a similar concept, regrading, was buying in bulk and then selling in piecemeal. So there, back then there were notions that Real producers should meet real consumers and there shouldn't be entities in the middle. We still have these concerns and and certainly in the futures markets and and in energy and commodities, right? We we, uh, have incidents of concern about that. But but antitrust and, and bigness certainly comes with the Industrial Revolution primarily rather than earlier conceptions in, in common law. Trevor mentioned monopoly, and before we go too much further into the history of the development of antitrust, I wanted to ask about that, like what what that term means because it gets – it's not just a board game. It gets kicked around a lot. People apply it to a lot of things. But is it – when we talk about a monopoly existing, do we mean simply that one market player has become very large 
or do we mean that one market player is really the one market player and that there there isn't there aren't other producers because you can imagine for certain products there there might just be a single producer but it's got a very you know not many people are buying its product and so we don't seem to worry about that kind of monopoly so where's where's the line like what what do we mean when we talk about a monopoly well you referred correctly to the two dimensions that people worry about one is size and one is how many of them are there and so technically, right, from the kind of dictionary definition, monopoly is one seller and monopsony is one buyer. No more, no less, period, full stop. Um, then there's size and, and sort of, uh, so in the, in the culture, in the popular language, people don't always stick to the technical definition of monopoly in that, in that when they say monopoly, they're also, they're basically saying there's this big thing out there that, lots of people are buying from and it's just swallowing up everything else and i'm scared to death about it uh right i mean it's it's uh, so th there's when you ask for what's the right definition there's both this the squishiness that you referred to is because in popular culture it is squishy um, even though if you look in the dictionary i think t technically it always means one seller and not any more than that and on t I mean, then there's a long tradition, which we usually talk about, I think we have in prior podcasts about utility regulation, which is something called natural monopoly, which are electric utilities and water systems and things like that, where it's the, both the economics and the physical nature of what's being provided make it difficult to conceive of more than one seller more than one electric distribution system, more than one uh, water or sewer system. It, it, uh, although we used to say that about cable, right? We used to say that about there couldn't be more than one provider of uh, access to video and the internet. And yet in, in my neighborhood, we have two. We have uh, both a telephone provided provider with a physical system and we have a cable provider with a physical system. So at least there where we thought there only could be monopoly, there in fact is duopoly or two sellers. In general, libertarians are, are pretty skeptical of uh, antitrust and mon anti-monopoly litigation. But we also seem to understand that, I guess maybe informed libertarians seem to understand that big businesses are not pro-market. It's very hard to run a big business under the principles of say libertarianism or Ayn Rand to be like, to be for the market, for the purpose of the market, big businesses tend to be for anti-competitive measures. So in the abstract, I mean, it seems to me that mon monopoly antitrust laws and anti-monopoly laws, they're not a bad idea and they might put a check on some of the expected incentive structures of big business. Well, I, I certainly when in conversations, I always say that um, libertarians probably ought to be and are in favor of antitrust in theory and never seem to be in practice. And, and the theory relates to the concerns you have, which is libertarianism is about rights, which is what Aaron and you and, and others in your shop talk about a lot. But it's also, I think, from an economic point of view, or if we went out in the culture and asked people, why is it okay to for free markets to exist and you run into the notion of choice, right? You can't have one, if, if the only entity where, or if there's only one place where you can buy whatever it is you want to buy, that doesn't strike people as, as a good idea. And so you then get into competition and you then get into market entry and choice and industrial organization. And how many sellers does it take to exist before people feel like there's no need to worry about how many sellers there are. In other words, there's a sufficient number so that if you don't like what's going on, you don't, you're not compelled uh, to do so. True, to be sure the government's not making you, but if you need to buy something and there's only one place to buy it, uh, then people say, well, how come there's not more than one thing? And so, um, uh, so Ch it's, Trevor, it, I think, you hit upon both those concerns. And one, I'll just end here with one of the fascinating things in doing research for this podcast. I came, 
I mean, I've read a lot and you, I talk about it in, in our discussions. I came across an article I did not know about, which is by George Stiegler, right? One of the real law and economics founders at the Chicago School of Economics. He wrote an article in Fortune magazine in 1952, where he was very much opposed to big business in the way Trevor described, which I, I said, what? And again, his, it, his, his view was he, he was anti-big business because the reaction to big business is big unions and big government. In other words, if there's a big thing out there on the private side, you need a countervailing power on the public side or in organized labor to deal with this big thing on the private side. And I thought about what, what Stiegler had anticipated was Galbraith's new industrial state written in the late 60s, which I had to read as an undergraduate, which was this description of corporatism, right? It's sort of everyone's organized, everyone's in a big organization and there's countervailing power and it all works out. And that's very different than a Jeffersonian atomistic market kind of everything works out. And, and so, um, yes, there is, even in libertarian thought there, and, and George Stiegler's essay is fascinating in that he too, for at least then, worried about big business, not because it was big business, but because there would be cultural forces that would lead to big unions and big government as a response. How did antitrust emerge in the United States? Um, I, I mean, are you, the Sherman Antitrust Act, is that what? what well, that's, that's one of them, definitely. Um, I mean, uh, basically, these, the, the, um, the demands for cap, in other words, steel, the steel industry and the oil industry had needs for capital and need for everything that just, as well as the railroads, that just just stunned uh, America, stunned markets at the time. I mean, their need for capital um, was, these entities were so big and employed, you know, tens of thousands of people in ways that no one had ever seen before. And that generated um, cultural reaction, both in the public, which was made to fear them, and also among those industries that were very threatened by the rise of these new entities. And so we had, to use an old Cato term, the sort of bootlegger and Baptist uh, coalition where entities that worried about being driven out of business by these new firms, i.e. other firms, they, they wanted the government to side with them. And then they wanted the public to think that they were ill served by these new large entities and that they were better served by smaller, uh, more small town and yeoman farmer kinds of businesses that they could touch and feel and understand in a way that they could not uh, about standard oil and, and U.S. steel, which were just mammoth organizations whose, that people could not comprehend. So the Sherman Antitrust Act comes out of, in 1890, comes out of, it, it has two statements. It says it outlaws contracts and restraint of trade, and it outlawed combinations, and those were trusts, right? So again, we're back to what were people afraid of? And the answer were these large entities whose actual form back then were trusts rather than, you know, one large corporation that we now think of as as what big companies are in that era. Cause we think about that as we, as I mentioned before, the kind of robber barons or what is popularly thought of as a robber barons era. But generally speaking, um, standard oil and U S steel, like were they monopolies in a harmful way? Cause there's two ways. It seems to me that you could look at this. One is you could just sort of say big is bad which would just be a, a sort of assertion of maybe there's too much political power, maybe there's not enough localism, even even if it if you look at prices going down, big is bad. Or you could just say, hey, look, is this benefiting the consumer? Um, and if the prices are going down, like, is that a good thing? And it doesn't even really matter how big it is. Um, and it's from what I know, both U.S. Steel and Standard Oil seem to be benefiting the consumer, even though they were massive on any scale, even today, for how big they were. 
Yes, yes. I mean, the, the, the irony, and I've read a lot in this, and, and what's interesting is uh, how little I've seen concern at the time about, well, let's see if prices are lower. I mean, it just a, a very simple kind of American notion that, well, I, you know, these may be mysterious and big and weird, and I don't understand them, but I'm not paying as much for stuff as I used to. And um, that's not, that was not the, I mean, eventually that became the reaction, uh, mostly after the mid 1970s. But ironically, it was not, um, it just doesn't seem to be part of the conversation for a very long time. Uh, and you don't have to go to Standard Oil and U.S. Steel. I mean, I think, again, in my reading, I think the most puzzling antitrust case of all time, and, and we'll we, I think we should talk about it because it's related to what people worry about now, and, and that is the A&P supermarket company, the Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Um, it had economies of scale. It had it was vertically integrated. And so it, it, it was very disruptive to the grocery market back then because small grocers had higher prices and markups and they were just being driven out of business. And the A&P supermarket company was just wonderful for consumers, but it generated legislative and cultural backlash. And again, the, the term had not been invented by Bruce e. Endel, bootleggers and Baptists, but uh, one sees bootleggers behind this, this ant cultural reaction. And um, what I don't know is the bat. In, in other words, I don't, I haven't read anything about religious leaders and uh, other cultural leaders at the time as to what, where, where they stood on all of this. Uh, there's, there's probably writing on it, but I, but I haven't uh, seen it. So the, the A&P supermarket company, and then, which was the Walmart of its time. And then the, the Wright Patman Act of 1936, which was dedicated to dealing with A and P, and then the indictment of A and P after World War II, and then its demise because of the indictment. It's just sort of a, you kind of scratch your head and go, what? And again, I this is sort of like the reaction to Amazon now, which is, wow, it's delivering stuff to our door and prices are lower, and I don't have to do anything. And like, oh, and but everyone's this mad. Is, <laughs> but everyone's mad. And it's like, mm. okay, so. So, uh, well, AMP is one of those companies that I think I only know about by reading kind of history of antitrust. But most I used people, to shop at AMP when I was a kid. That yes, was I, I did. I, I'm old. Oh, oh, they so still I, existed in Detroit. Okay, maybe they never existed in Denver. But um, I mean, it's pretty much gone. It would have been like Amazon or Walmart for people who are 50 or 60 years old. Correct. And, and people would have been like, there's no way that AMP is ever going anywhere. It's got such market power. Um, and that seems to be a, an interesting lesson because we hear these stories often about how these Fortune 500 companies are constantly in flux. The ones that were there in 1935 or 1965 or 1985 are not the ones that are there today. Um, and that competition is pretty fierce even when you're at the top. I mean, that that seems to be a lesson we can usually pull from that, right? Correct. I mean, I think in uh, I've looked at old Fortune magazines and uh, John Kenneth Galbraith was the editor way back in the 30s before he was an academic. And there's a cover from, I don't know, 1930 something, I forget what year. And it just impressed me. And it was on the Pennsylvania Railroad. And it said, this is the largest company in the United States. And uh, one, can, you know, they're at the peak of their power and blah, 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 blah. And you go, what? <laughs> By 1969, they were bankrupt. I mean, MySpace, Microsoft, yep. I was struck as you were talking about A&P and the, the cultural attitude of this was, you know, vertically integrated and was everywhere and was potentially driving smaller businesses out and that there was a cultural backlash against this. And yet now, like the hip place to shop is Trader Joe's, which is everywhere and growing like crazy and is exactly that, right? It certainly isn't a mom and pop and it's all Trader Joe's brand products and that's where all of the urban cosmopolitans – want to shop. It seems they've just kind of forgotten that angle of it as long as it like culturally aligns. Um, but also when we talk about like the Amazon thing, my sense is is not that 
the major objection to Amazon and the reason that there's people saying, you know, it should be broken up, it's a monopoly, it's bad, is is not because there aren't other e-commerce sites that are coming in, but because Amazon's bigness, ubiquity allows it to, say, exploit its workers. That that's been the big thing through COVID and why people are mad is that Amazon hire all these people that, that there's you know it said the working conditions are poor or the pay isn't great or Jeff Bezos's net wealth has climbed dramatically well you know his workers have not seen substantial raises is that part of this monopoly or antitrust conversation is not just the damage that like bigness could potentially do to consumers but that bigness allows worker exploitation i suppose i mean certainly it also comes up with walmart i mean walmart uh i once did the math though i mean What's interesting about retail is how razor thin the margins are. So, uh, see, I'll get the problem with doing math in real time and winging it is I'll get it wrong. But at it's one okay. time, our, our listeners won't get it right before. I mean, there's probably some math quiz listener you're going to get an email from, but we, dead reckoning is fine here. Well, I remember at looking up, I, I had a quote about Walmart's, I had the data on Walmart's profit in one year. And then, how many workers it has. See, retail is not very productive. Re the reason retail workers are not paid very much is because there's hundreds of thousands of them. And rather, and so it, the value added per worker is actually not very large, which is why they're not paid very well. And there were calls for Walmart to pay, I forget what the wage was. And it would, I sort of did the math and said, Oh, wow, that wage, that $2 an hour increase or whatever it was, would wipe out the profits of Walmart for an entire year. In other words, the difference between making a lot of money and not making a lot of money, if you have a lot of employees, so it may sound like nickel and diming workers, you know, that's just, wow, what a cheap, you know, that's just, that's like the, the you know, the Dickens character, right? And in, in, uh, Christmas Carol, that's just, Scrooge, right? And so, but because there's so many workers who aren't very productive, if you pay them each something more, that's basically where your profit came from. It's not true in industries where workers are much more productive, but in retail, uh, it is. But culturally, yes, that's how people attack. So the United Commercial Food Workers, right? They're one of the unions that wants to organize McDonald's and I mean, they want to organize low wage workers and increase their pay. The problem is, is that, and, the, and those companies make a lot of money, it seems like, but they don't make much money per worker, if you follow what I'm saying. So to give each worker what seems to ordinary people or middle class people a, a sort of sensible wage would actually wipe out much more of the profits in the, in the, in those sectors than you would it first think unless you did the math? When we talk about firms being anti-competitive, it, it seems a little difficult for me to define that. And I'm a, I'm a lawyer, so I've read some of these cases, but uh, I mean, there are ways that I can imagine being totally anti-competitive, like sort of stealing trade secrets or doing some other kind of nefarious things to undermine your competitors. There's always the idea of, of a, a uh, what is the word I look for? Dropping your pri predatory pricing, like that kind of behavior. Um, but sometimes if you're anti-competitive, it's because you're just better at what you're doing. And then the other thing that's always struck me as weird is it's kind of hard to define what some who some firms are competing against. Um, I seem to remember a case, uh, an antitrust case about movie theaters in Dallas or something like that in the sixties where some company controlled 50% of the movie theaters or something. And so they were comparing the pricing structure between movie theaters, but aren't movie theaters competing against every form of entertainment that is not a movie. And like, there's a lot of firms that just do not directly compete on a one-to-one -one scale with other firms. So that all this makes defining any competitive as kind of a philosophical question as much as an economic one. Correct. I mean, that there's, there is much ink spilled over trying to define what the relevant market is when you're calculating what are called the Hirschman Herfindahl indices, right? These are so antitrust now has a whole technical apparatus of which, when a merger is proposed, the uh, very well paid economists in the Justice Department 
sit down and try to calculate uh, what the Hirschman Herfindahl ind index would be pre and post merger and whether or not it rises above a certain number. And if it rises above a certain level, then that merger is declared to be problematic because of the, and, but as Trevor said, it, well, what's the market? And so, and, and Trevor went beyond, which is let's say the market is for widgets, but then widgets, you could spend all your money, not on widgets, but on some other kind of thing, right? Manufactured good. Um, or if it's, is, is the market for entertainment broadly construed or is it about movies in Dallas in certain zip codes? How many providers, right, are there? And, and that choice um, is not really a scientific choice. It's just like if you define the market this way and then you ask technical people to make calculations, they will come up with an answer. And then you say, should the government try to think about substitutes beyond movies in this zip code in Dallas. In fact, if they don't spend it on movies, is bowling equally useful for uh, spending one's entertainment dollar? That's kind of out. I mean, we can give you an elasticity estimate. We can say if the price of movies rises by so much, how many people stop seeing movies and start doing something else, i.e. bowling with their entertainment dollar? So I could, we could actually find the scientific answer to that question. Then you'd have to say, is it, should the government intervene to make movies more competitive, even though if they weren't, people would drift into bowling, if you see what I'm, so yes, there's both technical and broader philosophical questions lurking in, in this discussion. I'm going to go back for a moment to predatory pricing that Trevor mentioned, because I have heard this horror story told of you've got a street with, you know, like local, you know, say like small record stores and they've been in business forever. And then a big box record store comes in and it intentionally, because it's got big boxes all over. And so it's got, you know, profits coming in from all over the country can on that street cut the cost of records by 50%. So it's radically undercutting the the mom and pops, but it's also losing money on every record sold. And then it drives them out of business because people flock to the half off. And then once it's driven them all out of business, it can jack up its prices to either just as high as they were at the beginning or you know even higher and hurt the consumers. Does that sort of thing actually happen? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> But that story you just told is repeated over and over and over again. And it's the source of cultural support for it. Remember the bootleggers and Baptists, right? This is the Baptist sort of, stuff. but the people who peddle this story are usually the small firms whose costs are higher. I mean, so what, what innovators do is, is show that there's economies of scale in something for which people used to think there weren't, right? So Tower Records is, is something. Uh, I remember the innovation and I remember going, I mean, the stores were, I mean, it's just amazing, right? Tower Records changed everything from, and, and undercut traditional smaller local record stores. I remember in New Haven, there was, oh goodness, I can't remember the name, but all, all college towns have a small family run exotic record store that has jazz and this and that and the other thing. And then if Tower Records is anywhere nearby, like in New York or Boston, it was in New Haven, um, then all those little record stores that cater to audiophiles who went to NYU, um, they, they couldn't make it, right? They couldn't compete. But it wasn't because they're pricing below cost. They're, it's just that their, their costs are, are lower. Um, now, Amazon, I mean, it, it, Amazon lost money for 18 years. They made money, but they took all the money and reinvested because it turns out for what they do, there are large economies of scale, or not large, but at, at least sufficient economies of scale so that they're, the marginal costs of distributing and toing and froing and all of that actually kept going down a bit as they got bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's another way people to I mean, you know, a firm that never makes money for 20 years, isn't that, isn't, shouldn't that be illegal 
or something like that. So that certainly comes up with Amazon's history. If we're looking at the B, I like this question that we ask is the behavior of businessmen, business women, business people, Aaron's question, when I've been asking about predatory pricing, I've, I've said it, it seems like a very crazy business decision, wherein if you're in a competitive market, you're kind of taking this huge risk to lose money on the hopes that you'll gain it back in the end. Um, and there's a lot of discussion of antitrust where you, at least in the popular kind of person, you know, twiddling their mustache with a monocle, mwahaha about how they're going to take over some industry, that th they're behaving as a business person usually wouldn't behave uh, because it'd be highly risky. And usually if someone is a CEO of a company, even a very big one, is constantly looking in their rearview mirror uh, for what's coming up next. I mean, Blockbuster Video got caught napping by Netflix and everyone else. And you see this time and time again. So in general, sh should we be more concerned about the kind of elements of markets so that uh, some markets, some businesses may not have to be as aware of competition because there are barriers of competition, either artificial barriers or ones that are created by government uh, that actually make it more of a concern for a trust or a monopoly than most sort of standard competitive markets? Yeah, one of the interesting things to think about, and certainly a lot of what business school is about, and, or a part of business school is about, is brands. I mean, here, you talk about technical versus philosophical question, which is, is are Coke and Pepsi competitors? And you kind of think, Peter, are, are you... What did, what did you have for lunch, right? Did it alter your, as we're recording? I mean, until I read the paper in question where, where this came up, I hadn't, of course, Pepsi and Coke are competitors, but is Coke, I mean, Coke and Pepsi taste different. So because it's a trademark secret, and it, so for the particular thing called Coke, Coke is a monopolist. There are other colas, right? But they taste slightly different. So if you're really, really into Coke, there are no substitutes. And the same may be true for uh, like Apple people, right? People love Macintoshes or computers, right? There, I, there's some term for them in popular culture. And what per, you can tell, you guys are more informed than I am. There's, you know, there's the, the normal computer market and then there's Apple. And so Apple price is higher and all iPhones and so are, are, good, are Android phones competitors for iPhones? Well, for the real iPhone person, the answer is no, right? <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely, and so yeah. This, um, do you see how it gets weak? I mean, again, there's this technical notion of competition and how much is there and all that, but it's back to Trevor's earlier statement about, well, how do you know what a market is? And then is there a market for phones which have different brand names and different features? Or are there different, you know, there's some monopolies for certain things. And then there's competitors that are slightly different. And for most people, that doesn't matter. And that's good enough. I'm not sure if this question, this follow-up is going to make sense because it's not 100% clear in my head, but I'm just going to rush forward with it. I wonder if thinking of this this relationship like are what are the markets and are they competitors or are they in their own markets because they're slightly different and that we can kind of as we zoom in and out, we can see, we can say they're in the market, they're in the same market, they're not. That that might potentially scale with prices. So at if if Coke and Pepsi cost exactly the same amount then the reason that I'm choosing between choosing one or the other has to do with entirely the taste of them. And in that case, they're not competing in the same market because what matters is that Coke tastes like Coke and so that's the Coke market and Pepsi tastes like Pepsi and that's the Pepsi market. But if Coke jacked its prices up much higher, I might start to, I guess, place less emphasis on the subtle differences in flavor because I that whatever a little marginal utility I get from the difference in flavor between Coke and Pepsi doesn't outweigh the cost difference. And so then they move into the same market 
i.e. like I would substitute to a different good. And so I'm also thinking of like the iPhone, you know, you might say the iPhone doesn't the, – the iPhone diehards don't see it having competitors. But if the cost of the iPhone becomes sufficiently high, then they will start seeing it as having competitors because they'll be more willing to look at similar but cheaper phones. All true. Well said. I mean I don't – I can't add – I mean prices matter. And so what firms try to do is raise prices to the point where they make the most money. And they're always experimenting with what's called product differentiation. I mean, there's a whole literature out there about why are there so many different kinds of Triscuits or, you know, supermarkets, right? Brand differentiation. One, are they trying to block entry by occupying 17,000 square feet of the cracker shelves? And, and the, to some economists, the answer is yes. Or is this, you know, okay, because the thin Triscuit market is really different than the thick one. And it really did. You see what I'm saying? And, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, but eventually if prices get high enough, because there is an income constraint, firms go over the edge and people start looking and then they are toast before they know it. I mean, this, yes. All of what you said is true, and business school tries to, unlike economics, which is about consumer welfare, business school is all about trying to train people to exploit the differentiation that you describe so that to the extent possible, they can make profits without inducing entry and or consumer uh, choice and or consumer thinking about going to something else. How does this work then when the price is zero? So right now we have – the government has announced antitrust action against a bunch of big tech companies and some of them, Google, Facebook, set their price at zero. It doesn't cost me anything to use Google outside of a handful of services that I might pay for, but most people don't. It costs zero for consumers to use Facebook and so these firms aren't competing on prices at all. So how do we how do we think about monopolies and market and market entrance and competition in a market where consumers aren't charged any prices? Good question. Um, my simple pedantic answer is um, if the price if if something's free, then you can't talk about whatever it is as a market. I mean it's just so what the modern what Google and Facebook and um, the other electronic platforms are are they're they're creating markets for advertising, and thus in, in notwithstanding all the philosophical questions we had earlier about what is a market is and whether digital advertising is separate from other advertising. I think of Google and Facebook as competing with network television and radio and print. And all other forms th through which firms try to reach consumers with a message about their characteristics or their prices. And so for me, the question is, is, is the market for advertising been made more or less competitive by uh, these new firms? And as best I can tell, um, it's made it different in the following sense. Um, the think of Cato. I mean, Cato tries to advertise its it, it buys lists of people and and broad dem, dem, demographics. It says these people are over age sixty and have this kind of income, and we can sell you the their names, and, and you can send a little Cato thing and ask for donations. But what Facebook and Google do is try to have much more fine tuned information, which to some people raises privacy concerns if it's obtained without consent. And in effect, to make the market for reaching the people you want to reach much more clarified and much narrower, and thus you're not wasting advertising dollars on reaching people through a circular in the newspaper, which then everyone calls junk mail and then throws away. And so when I finally read uh, an, an article about what 
what Facebook and Google do for advertisers, I said, oh my God, that's just, that's helping them waste less money on, on advertising. And I happen to like newspaper circulars and the old fashioned thing. And I read those. And I, even though most people think of it as junk mail, but um, I have to admit that most people don't read them. And thus all that newsprint and all that, all that money spent attempting to reach consumers to describe prices and product characteristics, it's better for society to spend less money on that than more money. And, that, and thus uh, these new, Digital entities are, in some sense, I think, improving the advertising market. Um, and thus, there is no market for search. I mean, that, that's the, so saying that Google has a monopoly on the market for search. Well, there is no market for search because no one pays for search. So to get back to your original question, which is you can't talk about markets unless they're prices. So this whole discussion has led me to this kind of thinking about the question of in the way that we're concerned with as as economists, libertarians, can we think of an example of a monopoly? I mean, it seems like we've punched holes in a bunch of, you know, Standard Oil and U.S. Steel to some extent. I mean, again, we're going to be maybe going back to definition, but, um, you know, has there been an example of the kind of the market creating a monopoly that, that we can think of wherein it did the kind of things that people believe that these monopolies can do, setting prices without any concern for consumer welfare um, and sustained it for like a meaningful period of time. Um, or, or maybe I'm asking in the sense that is there one of those that has not been facilitated or created by government or other regulations that help create those things? Maybe, I mean, maybe you don't know the answer, but maybe part of the point is that it's hard to think of that, even though a lot of people on the other side think it's obvious that monopolies exist everywhere all the time and they're just constantly popping up. But if you actually think about it, it's hard to even name one. Not monopolies. I mean, I think what I can provide evidence on is there are um, – there's a subset of antitrust that's worried about mergers, right? So, I mean, how, in other words, how it should – the government have the right to think about and then intervene in the number of competitors in a market, even though we've said how difficult it is to know what a market is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are articles in the literature that talk about the effects of mergers and for things on like dishwashers and washing machines and uh, et cetera. And there's, I think in, in the notes that I've distributed, I talk about the effects of mergers and, refer to some articles by Orly Ashenfelter, um, who's a famous econometrician at Princeton. And he studied the, the Maytag Whirlpool merger and found in very co convincing econometric fashion that there were some markets in which Whirlpool and Maytag competed before the merger. And there were markets in which they did not compete. And i.e. dishwashers versus dryers and washers. And in the markets where they competed before, prices for those products after the merger went up by four to five percent. That's a, so. That's a. I mean, it, so. In other words, do does it matter how many competitors there are in a market for, you know, goods like that? Even though, despite our our earlier Coke Pepsi discussion, like, oh well, a Maytag washer and a Whirlpool washer and an LG washer and a, you know, a, a different brand. Those are all really separate markets because they're special or a Bosch and, and thus they don't really compete with each other. Well, I think for most people, unlike Apple, uh, most people think of washers as washers. And uh, so, um, so there's one example. The second example I would bring up and I, I wanted to discuss with you guys is the, the recent Apple Amazon book publisher case with book distribution and uh, whether or not that was mischief or not and whether the government did consumers a good thing by intervening uh, in what Apple was trying to do. That case, so even though we're libertarians and, and, and economists are good at coming up with all the stupid things antitrust did. There are some, I mean, that case, for example, strikes me as what Apple was up to was not helping consumers. It was trying to do a job on Amazon 
and Amazon, quote, selling books below what publishers wanted them to be sold at and breaking the publishing model. And then Apple was going to, in effect, not buy the books from publishers, but just act as an agent to sell and then cut the revenue with the publishers, et cetera, et cetera. And um, again, I'm, I'm, at least what from what I've read, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen many right of center economists write to say intervening in that case through antitrust was obviously pure mischief and f not for consumers, et cetera, et cetera. So those are two, two notions that I, but they're not monopolies for long periods of time. Uh, yeah, it seems like quite often that the, the apparatus for the state to intervene in these monopolies is either misinformed, radically misinformed with just a bad paradigm for looking at the situation, i.e. defining the market, or it's a gamesmanship on behalf of competitors trying to put someone out of business, or it takes so long, like the Microsoft case of the late 90s, where it takes so long that by the time they they get the case together. The purported mar monopoly has has gone away. Um, so, like, yes, generally, I mean, it's, sorry, continue. Well, just the the long one was the the long, long, long attempt to break up AT and T, which <laughs> then sort of gradually put itself back together. And then, because communication changed from landlines, it's it's all kind of you just look at how much energy, money, and whatever was spent over figuring out how to deal with the telephone system. Um, it, it just, if to talk to anyone under my age that we spent years and years and years trying to create competition over landlines, um, they'll just go, and you, what? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and yet we did. Uh, we did spend go, an go enormous Ma, amount Ma Bell. of energy yeah. over that. So. But the, so is, I mean, is the bottom line, it seems to me that uh, there's a good reason to be, skeptical of claims to antitrust and actions against antitrust um, doing the kind of consumer benefit that they're purported to say, even though occasionally there might be some we could imagine that could be beneficial. They seem to be far outnumbered by the ones that are not beneficial. Is I think so. I think, I think looking, I mean, that's, I think that's a fair reading, but we sort of on one side of it. I mean, it, it, I find this, Despite a hundred and whatever years of thinking about this, it, people still remarkably fall along ideological lines. And uh, Fiona Scott Morton and, and Herbert Hofenkamp, right, a famous Yale economist and a famous, the most famous antitrust, well, legal, he, he's at Wharton now, he was at Iowa forever, Herbert Hofenkamp. Um, they are, they're writing, you know, if I, if I gave you their articles to read, uh, you would, and, and Hovenkamp is seen as a kind of a neutral, middle of the road antitrust person, not a, not a Lena Khan, you know, Brandeisian by any means. And those middle of the road, probably liberal academics still see an urgent need for antitrust. Uh, one of my colleagues at Princeton, Carl Shapiro, now is at Berkeley, he's, for vigorous antitrust enforcement. And he, he was chief economist for antitrust under Obama. So if it's frustrating to me is because I'm not an antitrust person, but if you locked all these people in a room and you forced them to wrestle with all their various articles and, and evidence, would they come to the conclusion you just stated, which is you can find instances where it appears that antitrust could and did do some good for consumers. But there's so much, so many cases and, and absurd things on the other side that it's hard, it, that is if you had to choose that we have nothing or have the apparatus we have, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be horrible to have nothing. I think that's a fair statement, but Nothing you will read from them suggests that's true. Thank you for listening 
If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.